Hi everyone, I'm gonna try and film with this tiny dog on hand today. Um, hopefully he behaves. Uh, I hope you're all taking care of yourself, taking care of yourselves. Um, today's video is about EastEnders longest reigning and probably most iconic inhabitant, the River Thames. Um, and it is iconic, it's really, really important. London would not exist without the Thames. Beans, you need to stop licking me, buddy. Um, the Thames is England's longest river. Um, and because the river reaches inland, it became used as a trading route very, very early on in its development, which eventually developed into a port, and then the port developed into a settlement, so lots of people came to live there, to work there. Now, there are a few theories about why the Thames gained its name, but I'm just going to give you a couple of seconds to think about where you think it gets its name from. So, Beans, do you want to think about where the Thames gets its name from? So, I hope you spent a bit of time guessing. Uh, most historians think that the name Thames comes, comes from this Middle English word called Thames, and that word means dark, which we think is a reference to the colour of the water. And the reason that was dark is because it was used as a place for hundreds of years to get rid of human waste. So, poo and wee, vomit, horrible stuff. And that is something that's going to come back to bite London in the butt during the Great Stink, but more on that later. So, let's go all the way back to the Romans. After invading Britain, the Romans made their way along the river, finally coming to what they thought was the perfect point for a port, um, and it was very, very close to where London Bridge stands today. Um, and the Romans, they decided to settle there, and that's in the area that is now known as the City of London, and they called it, they named it Londinium. And it became a major trading port, allowing Roman ships to trade products like grain and wine, and it offered, um, it offered routes to the rest of Britain as well, through the roads that developed from there. Um, and of course, I mentioned London Bridge earlier, the Romans also built the first ever bridge across the River Thames, which is gone now, um, but London Bridge was built later on the same site. So, following the end of Roman rule in Britain, um, most of us know that things went into what was called the Dark Ages, and at this time, uh, the area known as Londinium and the bridge were, were very, very neglected, and a lot of Viking raiders came along, taking whatever they could, whenever they could, and soon the wealth that the settlement had gained from being a major trading port was gone. And it wasn't until 866 uh, that London kind of became a bit more important again. And that was when Alfred the Great drove out those Viking invaders who were constantly raiding and destroying the area. And he reoccupied London, making it livable. So he came up with new street plans, he repaired the bridge, and he also provided extra fortifications on the south bank of the Thames to keep those pesky Vikings out. What are you doing? Um... Okay, so uh, later, uh, in about 1418, you've got King Edward III, who started to encourage workers, especially people like weavers and bricklayers, to come over from Holland and other parts of uh, Europe to come to develop English industry by sharing their skills. And one of those particular um, kind of people that he invited was called Henry Sondergiltz, who was a very successful brick man, meaning he was a brick maker. And he went to live in Deptford on the south of the river to supply bricks for the building of London Bridge. Um, in addition to that, the South Bank at that time, uh, which is currently where the BFI, National Theatre and all sorts of markets and festivities and things take place today, that was even a, a, a hub back then for trade in the 15th century. Um, and some people think that there were more spices and things available there from around the world than you can find in England today. Um, and that was due to the massive amount of trading ships um, that that were coming in and out of the port at that time. Uh, and a lot of people think you'd actually have to tra uh, travel to Asia to find those same spices in the same quantities today. So the idea that medieval people just had bland rubbish food is a little bit ignorant um, because they had access to lots and lots of different spices. So, in 1420, a few years after the river started to really bring success to London, shipbuilding began in areas like Deptford and Greenwich and to the south of the river where people were getting employment, repairing and fitting out boats. Um, and because there was more work there, more people moved there, so the city grew and expanded in size um, and especially in importance. 
Now, from South London, there was an old Roman road that connected the south of London to towns like Canterbury and Dover. So travellers from those other parts of southern England would travel to and from London using this road um, and as a result of that South London started to develop inns where travellers could eat and sleep and once those inns started to develop uh, that brought even more trade and commerce to the city so the more things that people built for the people who were travelling the more people travelled and that made the city even more vibrant. So because of the Thames London was becoming a multicultural city in about 1485, London had an Irish mayor. A lot of Polish travellers also began arriving in the area um, because the Thames was building up its trade links. And as a result of this success in trade, there was a lot of foreign interest in living in this ever growing city of London. Um, and in fact, by the 16th century, we know for a fact, because we have uh, records of this man's pay slips, that both Henry VII and Henry VIII had a black trumpeter called John Blank, who worked for them, uh, which indicates that there was also migration from Africa. And most historians think that John probably came to England as one of the attendants of the Spanish princess, Catherine of Aragon, in 1501. She was Henry VIII's first wife. Um, and John Blank is recorded as one of the earliest recorded black people in England after the Roman period. Um, of course, it's highly likely that there were many, many more um, who were unrecorded. So uh, moving on to the 16th century. So in the 16th century, London became a major centre of shipbuilding and repair. And Henry VIII, uh, he decided to build the Royal Naval Dockyard in Deptford. Now, Henry knew South London. Uh, really, really well, because he was born in Greenwich and he quite often travelled up the Thames in order to actually get into the city of London. And by 1544, the dockyards, uh, particularly in Deptford, had become the most important dockyards in England. Um, in addition, um, not too far down the river from Deptford was the Tower of London. It was only three miles away up the River Thames, which is where the Royal Armoury was. Um, so once the boats were built or repaired down the river in Deptford, they would sail up to the Tower of London um, in order to get their military supplies. Um, and later on, by 1576, London was the world's foremost trading port. Beans, what's wrong? Do you want to come and sit with me again? No? Okay, he's being a little bit sad. And we're back. So, um, South London changed really quickly once these docks were built, and the population grew, and it developed a huge community of people who had jobs and skills connected with the river, like fishing, sailing, transport, and boat building. Now, from this point on, um, South London grew and became a really, really important part of the country. And the South Bank, which I mentioned earlier, it developed to become more than a trading port, but also a cultural centre. And uh, what it had there was it had theatres and it had the Bear Gardens. Now, if you haven't heard of the Bear Gardens, this is pretty horrible. It's where people will come to watch this thing called a cruel sport of bear baiting, which is where a bear would be tied to a stake um, and be attacked by hungry, vicious dogs. Nothing like you, I'm afraid. Um, oh, thankfully. Um, and what would happen to make it a fair fight is the bear would usually have been declawed or blinded and the fun that people had was that the audience would bet on the outcome of, um, of this battle. It's pretty horrible really. I expect some people would have been against it at the time but that didn't really stop it from being popular. So that was seen as one of the cultural things you could do at the South Bank at that time. And the river had become so important, in fact, um, that when Sir Francis Drake returned from his expedition on his ship, the Golden Hind, he was actually knighted by the river in Deptford by Queen Elizabeth I. Why don't you stay here, buddy? Just stay here with me and then, then we'll go out for a walk in a minute, okay? Promise. Um, so, in 1697, Tsar Peter I of Russia, also known as Peter the Great, he travelled to England to learn about shipbuilding and navigation in order to establish the first Russian navy. And he stayed really, really close to the dockyards uh, where he could easily visit and learn about the ships being built. So, so in 
So I mentioned earlier when we were talking about the name of the Thames, originally the word came from the Middle English temes, which meant dark, uh, and that referred to how dirty the water was. So before Joseph Bagelget built London's sewer system, uh, most of the capital's waste was dumped in the Thames, and by waste I mean human waste. Um, and in 1858, it was one steaming hot summer. Temperatures were soaring, meaning that the stench from the river, which was London's main source of water, was so overpowering with the smell of poo that had been dumped there for hundreds of years, for centuries, um, that people were physically sick in the streets. That is how bad the smell of the Thames was. Um, it was literally being cooked in the river. So all of that human waste, hundreds of years old, was being cooked in the river. It looked like a huge brown sludge pool of steaming poo. And this was referred to as the, the Great Stink. And honestly, it was a long time coming. It's surprising that it didn't happen before 1858. Um, now, for more than 100 years before this happened, London was becoming in an increasingly unpleasant city to live in thanks to industrialisation. Maybe you've learnt about the Industrial Revolution. The population was growing, and another reason for this is that um, factories were springing up everywhere, they're filling the air with dirty smoke, and these filthy, dangerous slum houses were also being very, very quickly and very shoddily put up to house the poorest of the poor. And through all of this, through it all, ran the Thames, the dirty, stinking, oozing Thames. And people believed at the time that the smell was not only unpleasant, but it was deadly. Because at this time, bad smells were believed to be spreading diseases like cholera. They, they called bad smells miasma. They believed a bad smell would cause your illness. And by the 1850s, all kinds of things were flowing into the main river, including the waste from slaughterhouses and factories, and also accidental drownings and suicides were really, really common in Victorian London. So dead bodies would quite often remain bobbing and rotting in the Thames for, for months. So it wasn't a pleasant river at this time. It wasn't a place you'd want to go for a nice walk next to. Now, despite the very famous scientist of the time, Michael Faraday, explaining to the government why the river was so dangerous, um, and he urged Parliament to do something about it. They actually did very, very little until, of course, the smell began to affect them. They recently had built uh, the Houses of Parliament very close to the river, and once the smell started to prevent them, once it starts to prevent the rich from going about their lives, pre prevents the important government from going about their lives, that's when they decided to act, not when it was, you know, causing people to be sick in the streets and afraid to leave their homes. So they decided to close Parliament and find a way to get rid of the sewage, and that was by building London's first sewer system. Now, in the 18th century, the London ports, they struggled to cope. So another thing Parliament did was that they authorised the building of two new docks and warehouses on the Isle of Dogs. And later, more docks opened, including East India Dock, Millwall and the Royal Albert Dock. But not long later, about 50 years later, in 1869, the dockyards closed. And the reason for that was that Britain was at peace. Um, they didn't need warships anymore. And in addition to that, the Thames was getting shallower, which made it even more difficult for warships to travel up and down. Now this had a massive impact on the economy, uh, particularly for the people um, in the south of the river who had moved to those areas or had perhaps grown up in those areas for, for many generations because their families had jobs connected to the river. Later on in World War II, the Thames and London's docks suffered really heavily um, because the, the main bombs fell on the Thames because the Thames was very heavily targeted. So these attacks on the Thames, they, um, they started in 1939, they continued until about 1941. And the ports were left in a really, really terrible state. Um, almost 900 missiles, as well as thousands of incendiary bombs fell on the Thames. Um, and there were also a lot of attacks on private riverside property. So why do you think that would have been a target for the Nazis? So, as you can see, the Thames has had a huge impact on the development of London over the years. London might not actually exist at all, 
were it not for the Thames being present in its geographical location. So, is there anything you would like to learn about? Let me know in the comments. And as always, stay cute, be kind, and please subscribe.